remember being in Ramallah in Jerusalem. The Archbishop of Canterbury had taken a group of five of us to meet with the leaders from both sides, political and religious leaders. And on the last day we were dealing, we were meeting with Sheikh Talal, who's one of the four founders of Hamas, the militant group. Solidly built guy, he'd already spent 80, 18 years in prison. Some of his kids had been, had blown themselves up, suicide bombing, and we were to meet with Sheikh Talal. He hosted us for a lunch, big lunch, room was full of smoke as they puffed away at their cigarettes and all that stuff. The whole um, room, I, I find it very difficult to handle that with my vocal ulcers, but I had to sit through that for several hours. And as we finished that whole thing, the Archbishop interacted with him and he says to us five guys, why don't you ask a question each of the Sheikh and the whole group, his entourage surrounding his family. I won't tell you the question that I asked. But I didn't like the answer that he gave. And so I just said, Sheikh, you and I may never see each other again, but I don't like your answer. I said, let me just say this to you, sir. Not far from where you and I are sitting is a mountain. I said, 5,000 years ago, a man by the name of Abraham took his son up that mountain. Remember that story? He said, yes, I remember it. I said, let's not discuss which son. But he took his son up that mountain. I said, you know he took his son. And as the axe is about to come down, God holds his arm and stops it. He says, that's right. I said, what did God say? He looked at me blank. I said, God said, stop. I myself will provide. He said, that's right. I said, very close to where you and I are sitting 2,000 years ago. There's a hill. It's called Calvary. God kept that promise and took his son up that mountain. I said, shake. This time, the arm did not stop. He just stared at me. I said, Sheikh Talal, until you and I receive the son that God has provided for us, we'll be offering our own sons and daughters on the battlefields of this world for land and position and prestige and power. I shocked myself. I said, what on earth have I just said? And the Archbishop looked around, he said, I guess it's time to go home now, we'll go home. <laughs> so we started to walk away and as we were about to go down the steps, he put his arm around me and he said, Ravi, that was of God. I said, you really think so? I said, I sure hope so. <laughs> I said, I sure hope so. So we started to walk down and since the uh, Archbishop was the guest of honor, guest, guest of honor. We were just part of the hoi polloi. We were moving towards our cars and Sheikh is moving towards the Archbishop, but he hurriedly put the Archbishop in and came to running towards me. I said, here it goes. I'm going to be in Ramallah now the rest of my life. He grabbed me by the shoulders and he looked at me. Strong guy. He could have had me for lunch. He just holds me, pats me on both sides of the face, kisses me on both sides of the face, he said, Mr. Zacharias, you're a good man. I hope I see you again someday. And he just wipes his tears and he walks away. What comes of these seeds planted, only heavens will reveal. But I tell you what, I learned a very tough lesson that day. Wisdom is something we desperately need in the most crisis-ridden moments. He drew the line of resistance, drew the line of dependence, and lastly drew the line of confidence. What's the confidence? God's going to rescue us. If he doesn't rescue us, we're still not going to compromise. Young people, that's what it's going to take. He'll rescue us. If he still doesn't rescue us, we won't compromise. And so let me just close with an illustration of the words of a hymn. Last year I had the privilege of being at one of the great prisons of America. It's um, called the Angola Prison in um, Louisiana. It was the bloodiest prison in the country. 5,300 prisoners. 85% 80, of them are life without parole. Life without parole. 45 of them on death row. When you were checked into that prison a few years ago, you were given your bedsheet and your pillow and you were given a dagger, a knife to protect yourself. 
because the walls, the carpets were all smeared with blood. It was a tough guy's prison. Then comes this new warden, quite amply built. And he said, I'll take over this place if you allow me to do it my way. What does he do? Bible verses all over the place. Chapel, Bible studies, bachelor's courses in theology by New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. He's changed the whole place. Gangs are being disbanded and becoming gangs of pastors. <laughs> Profanity is not allowed in that prison, neither by staff nor by the prisoners. You can take the mind almost fine-looking young woman to walk past those cells. There'll be no cat calls, there'll be no nasty words, nothing. I walked past from cell to cell, shook hands with some of those boys on death row and prayed with them. And Pope spoke to a packed audience and the message was piped into every cell. The hardest part was to go to the death chamber. Where you see the bed where they strap him in. And on the outside is a table with four chairs where they have their last meal. And on the other side a little separation from where members of the law and somebody representing the family if they want to see that is done properly are there. On the wall of phone where the governor can still stay the sentence for a period of time. You sit down in that chair at the table and you say to yourself, you know, I'm coming here as a visitor, I'm walking out. What does it mean for a man who's sitting down for his last meal? When you sit down, you look at the wall. Do you know what you see? You see a painting. Painted by a prisoner. Do you know what the painting is? Daniel in the lion's den. Basically saying, God can still rescue you. And you know what comes into your mind. What if he doesn't? You look to the right, the same prisoner painted another painting. Elijah going up on chariots of fire. Amazing. Amazing. That a prisoner found out one way or the other, God would be his rescue. If he chooses to take you one way, well, if not, he's got another plan for you live with him in glory. Ladies and gentlemen, draw the lines in the right places. The line of resistance, the line of dependence, and the line of confidence. And then you can also write, really, that there are no reserves, no retreats, and no regrets. Charles Wesley wrote, O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire. Still stir up thy gifts in me. Ready for all thy perfect will, my acts of faith and love repeat, till death thy endless mercy seal, and make my sacrifice complete. The cancer of our time can be described in one word, meaninglessness. Meaninglessness. You talk to an average young person today, how many sexual trysts do they really want to find fulfillment? How much money in the bank do they really want to find fulfillment? The loneliest people in the world I have found have been the most indulgent ones who've come away totally empty. As Chesterton said, meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. Meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. Skeptics often tell me that it's the problem of pain that keeps them from believing in God. May I suggest to you, it's the problem of pleasure that keeps me from being totally secular. Been there, done that, tried this. It simply doesn't work. I recall when I was doing a Bible study with the Atlanta Braves when they were playing the St. Louis Cardinals, sort of 10, 12 minutes each of the chapels. And uh, I walked in there and uh, I closed with this. I said to them, 
You know, fellas, there's nothing like walking into a room and being the only one who fails the physical. I said, I looked at you boys, muscles bulging like watermelons, and I walk in here. I'll never forget the line of my wife once when I gave her a nice good hug. She smiled, hugged me back, and said, you know what? You have the arms of a thinking man. I burst out laughing. She, yes, and she said, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean that in a bad way. I didn't mean that. Oh, what a compliment. What a compliment. I said, I'll do my best to make these the arms of a non-thinking man. <laughs> so I said, guys, I can't talk to you about baseball. You guys hit a ball long before I know it's even come. So I'm not, no, I'm not going to talk to you about that. I said, here's what I want to talk to you about. How to live your life on the road, because I've probably lived that longer than any one of you sitting in front of me. They leaned forward and started to listen. One of the most notable players from one of the team's multi-million dollar contract walks up towards me and he puts his hand on the back of my neck like this, and then puts his head on my shoulder and starts to sob, and my travel assistant, knowing it was a very precious moment for him, just walked away into the distance and he looked at me and he said, Ravi, I have more money than I ever thought I'd have, but I want to tell you I've lost everything of real value in my life. I wish I'd applied the principles you gave us today long before. Are we on the highway to abandonment with pleasure without principle, pleasure without boundaries? Think about it. Think about it. You can't have everything. You can't. Meaninglessness is the plague of an average university student around the globe today. I could find better ways to make a living than what I'm doing. But this is a calling. This is a conviction. And I will tell you, I have seen lives transformed who have taken that path and turned away from complete hedonistic paths to a life that builds its moral boundaries with the revelation of God himself.